So let's wrap up uh, the anti-inflammatories, and this is continuing about the, uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and some of the controversial things. I pointed out the issue before, oh great, the, the pointer's not working. Uh, uh, there we go. Uh, about when to run chemistries, even down here in this uh, section it says, uh, this is a quote, regular metabolic monitoring should be performed. All right, how often is regular? And again, most of your hepatotoxicities occur in the first month, typically in the 75% in the first two weeks after you start. So I definitely believe in getting them back and running serum chemistries and certainly warning the owners of the signs to watch for, uh, for adverse effects, gastric ulceration, all those things, but particularly uh, ge um, hepatotoxicity, the type B adverse reaction. Okay. What we don't have a firm handle on is what's the instance after that. Uh, do you really need to bring that animal in every six months for the rest of its life at its own Remedil? Uh, probably not, in my view, but we're, we're lacking hard data. So that's one of the, the controversial issues, is yes, you're going to monitor serum chemistries when you first put them on, and for a time thereafter, I would probably do two weeks or a month and then bring them back at six months. After that, I'm, I'm a little less sold that it's necessary but you'll see clinicians that routinely bring them back every six months uh, that they're on an NSAID. The other thing, washouts, uh, this is a quote from um, proceedings. In general, a five-day washout between NSAIDs is recommended and 10 days for aspirin or meloxicam. The idea here is that if you're switching NSAIDs, and we do that because sometimes one NSAID works for a patient that, uh, better than another NSAID. So uh, it's not uncommon to try different NSAIDs to get the best um, benefit for the patient. But you don't want them overlapping, giving you dual inhibition of the cyclooxygenase predisposing to toxicity. <clears throat> the reason that uh, it's a controversy for me is that there's absolutely, positively no data that supports that. Um, if you, the concept is valid, but if you look at the half-life on some of these, and this is where I had an effect of food, this is when I had um, Topoxyl and Zubrin because it did have an effect of food. I probably could eliminate that column now because everything else, food doesn't really affect uh, the absorption that much. But you do see the half-lives and uh, three hours, um, eight hours, 12, this sort of thing. Remember uh, a half-life concept. If we're going on, most of these are around 12 hours. So if you say uh, three half-lives, you've got 80-something um, percent, five half, four half, five half-lives, you've got 95%. So about four and a half days, you've got all that going. Do you really need to go that long? I'm not convinced, well, no, two and a half days. Do you really need to go five days? I think you need to allow some time, <clears throat> but I'm not convinced of this blanket five day, 10 day. Uh, even, now, meloxicam is, is the one with the longest half-life, about a day. So there, I would tend to go more toward four or five days. So my kind of thinking generally is uh, about two days for most NSAIDs and maybe about four or five days for meloxicam. The reason for the aspirin long is because of the platelet issue. All right, you don't want uh, the platelets inhibited if you're doing surgery, but in terms of it interfering with another NSAID, I don't see the rationale. So <laughs> yes, I think there, there should be a washout between NSAIDs, I just kind of think they're being a little overly precautious, cover your ass sort of scenario with uh, some of the recommendations. Okay. So um, you'll see different uh, views on that. Um, I added this slide, sorry, I added it this morning uh, because I was reviewing your objectives, which I suggest you do. And I noticed I hadn't included anything about combining insets and steroids, okay? And as you can tell, that is a no-no, 
All right. Um, both are ulcerogenic, GI ulcers. Steroids only mildly so. Uh, if, if you actually put experimental animals on high dose NSAIDs, most will not develop GI ulcers. But we know it is a risk factor. But if you put them on both a steroid and an NSAID, you are asking for them to get a GI ulcer. I mean, you really are rolling the dice, particularly if it's a non-selective NSAID, one of the older ones combined with the steroid, it's a big, big risk. It's not uncommon we see dogs come in with GI ulcers and that's exactly what's happened is the referring veterinarian had them on a steroid and an NSAID simultaneously. Now the COX-2 select is probably are not as big a risk, but it's still no risk. My general recommendation is avoid giving the dog an NSAID if he's had uh, has a steroid on board. And remember, that depends on the biological half-life and the formulation as to how long that steroid is going to work. All right. So I've not included that. I wanted to make sure you're aware of that point. All right. <coughs> now, acetaminophen. I separated acetaminophen out because really, though we use it like an NSAID, it's not considered by most textbooks to be a true NSAID. And the, the reason it was included that way is because we really don't understand how it works, uh, truthfully. Uh, <coughs> it uh, does not inhibit cyclooxygenase, but seems to regulate prostaglandin by some unknown mechanism. Now, at one time, they thought they had it worked out when they discovered <coughs> uh, there was a COX-3 enzyme and acetaminophen inhibited it until they start, took a closer look and found out it takes huge doses to inhibit COX-3, nothing that we would achieve physiologically. So we still really don't know how acetaminophen uh, works. So that's why it's typically not classified as an NSAID by the textbooks, but I'm including it here because we use it for two of the main things. We use it for fever control and analgesia. Okay. Now, it has very little anti-inflammatory effect, but that's, we don't use NSAIDs really typically for inflammation anyway. Uh, <clears throat> the, the good thing about it is that it's, it's really non-ulcerogenic. The COX-2s have a lesser risk of ulcerogenic. Acetaminophen basically has no risk of GI ulcers, okay? <clears throat> and very little to no effect on platelets, all right? so. Um, uh, like that dog on steroids that I can't give an NSAID to, but he has a fever, I can give him acetaminophen. All right, you know not to do it to a cat, okay, but dogs. The toxic dose of acetaminophen uh, in dogs is about the same as it is in the human, all right. So yes, you can put any animal into acetaminophen uh, poisoning, but the cat is the one that's really susceptible. Uh, the dog, as long as you use it in the proper doses, uh, shouldn't be uh, an issue. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, I have done that to lower fevers, again, mostly in dogs that have had steroids that I, I don't want to give an NSAID to. And another good thing is acetaminophen comes as a suppository, so if they can't take it orally, you can get a rectal suppository to use. Uh, our main use, truthfully, though, is uh, combined with codeine as either Tylenol number three or number four. Uh, and truthfully there, we're interested mainly in the codeine for analgesia and we're just adding the acetaminophen so that it's a Schedule 3 instead of a Schedule 2 drug. All right, Schedule 2 drugs are a pain in the ass to work with, all right, because you got to keep so many much um, more detailed records and so forth, so you'd rather use something that's not a Schedule 2. And adding acetaminophen to the, the codeine decreases the risk of abuse, so they move it to a lower schedule. So mostly, uh, the main use is really in Tylenol 3 or number 4 when we're using codeine for pain control. And by the way, they make um, Tylenol number 1, 2, 3, and 4. They all have the same amount of acetaminophen in each tablet. It's the amount of codeine in each tablet that varies. And it goes something like 15, 30, 45, and 60 milligrams of codeine as you go 1, 2, 3, and 4. Yes?
if they have, uh, were given injectable steroids, yes, they would still be at risk from uh, the GI uh, ulcers if you gave an NSAID. Both of them can be injectable and you'll still be at risk. That's a systemic effect. Aspirin is the main uh, one that has a local caustic irritation. Others are through systemic uh, mechanisms. Yes? So if it's so the middle of the night and a client calls you and your dog is having fever and in pain, would you prefer them to give the animal a Tylenol or an I'd probably go with aspirin in most cases um, um, just because uh, single doses, you're really not going to cause an ulcer very likely unless it's pre-existing. That would be the only reason to choose the acetaminophen. Now having said that, uh, acetaminophen is the more common painkiller that people will have at home uh, unless they're on low dose aspirin. That not many people keep aspirin around these days comparatively. Anything else? Good question. If they're on steroids, how long should they be off of steroids? And there's no precise answer. Remember I gave you the biological half-life uh, of those. I'd want at least past that uh, and possibly an additional day or two. Now what we get into with problems uh, when we're getting into these washouts, whether that's because they've got a steroid or you're switching NSAIDs, is what do you do in the meantime for pain control? And that's where we, uh, we use things like this. So uh, oral codeine derivatives, tramadol, although it's questionable how good tramadol is as an analgesic, buccal buprenorphine is another one that we can use. So we have to go to something for pain control while we're doing this washout. Okay, good questions. All right, there, um, and the risks, the side effects, particularly the hepatopathy associated with the NSAIDs, got so much press, the FDA is really adamant that veterinarians uh, make sure clients know the risks of using an NSAID in their pets. And so they require every uh, formulation to have a um, uh, label insert warning or side effect letter that, that's made specifically for you to give to the client. So uh, they have patient advisories that you can just, some, some companies provide them as peel off sheets or you can go to this website and, and uh, download them and print them as you needed. But basically it's for the owner and it tells them all of the side effects and what to uh, uh, watch for. So it's really easy to do any time you give a, an NSAID the first time to print one of these out for that specific NSAID and, and provide it to the owner so they can't say, oh, you never told me about that, okay. <clears throat> now we'll wrap up with some kind of miscellaneous anti-inflammatories, things that I hadn't, uh, don't really fall into um, easy categories. Uh, one uh, is when you're treating inflammatory bowel disease or ulcerative colitis, and that's the amino salicylates. <coughs> uh, five amino uh, salicylic acid is used to reduce the inflammation of the lining of uh, the intestinal tract, uh, particularly the lower GI tract, uh, <coughs> by standard NSAID mechanisms, inhibiting cyclooxygenase, that sort of thing. The primary drug we we do a touchstone in the sulfonamide portion, it's sulfasalazine. It's really a prodrug, it's inert, uh, but uh, the uh, ASA is linked to a sulfonamide and very little of it uh, is absorbed in the small intestine, but when it gets into the colon, bacteria uh, break that bond and you get the sulfonamide released and you get the uh, salicylic acid released and the salicylic acid is what's having the benefit, okay? So uh, you will sometimes see this, uh, this used. Now, mesalamine, I mentioned uh, in humans, they more commonly use mesalamine because uh, that release sulfa, a lot of humans are allergic to sulfonamide drugs. So they'd rather use just the active ingredient. Um, <clears throat> the problem is uh, that it, um, you have to use an enteric coated product, otherwise it all gets absorbed in the small intestine and it never reaches the colon. 
So having said that, most veterinarians use the sulfatalazine <coughs> just because they're used to it and we don't see that many sulfonamide allergies in our animals. So it's an option for IBD uh, when you want something either instead of or in addition, usually instead of a steroid or other immunosuppressive. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough, gold, yes, it's real gold, is used to control inflammation. Uh, you don't have to know these forms, but uh, they discovered this early in the 20th uh, century um, when they were treating, trying to find a treatment for tuberculosis, and gold was one of the things that they d thought might work. That didn't work out so well but uh, they discovered that rheumatoid arthritis patients tended to benefit from this gold therapy. Uh, and uh, although for the longest time and for your purposes we say we don't know how it works, there is a proposed mechanism that I didn't go into. Uh, but it, it does seem to help. It's got a slow onset, it takes months to work, and it's got a lot of toxicities, including liver and kidney and bone marrow, a lot of skin uh, uh, things too. Uh, the only reason I mention it is uh, dermatologists will use it for pemphigus that's failed to respond to other immunosuppressives, or the patient can't tolerate the immunosuppressive. So steroids, cyclosporin, and all those things that we use to control autoimmune diseases normally gold salt therapy is, is still a rational choice in a uh, very few patients. Okay. And then we have the antibiotics that we're not really using uh, as antibiotics per se. Uh, the tetracyclines I mentioned in uh, that discussion of antibiotics that they do inhibit collagenase and also protein kinase C and granuloma formation. Uh, Dr. Bette Bees, I believe on one of her slides, listed the tetracyclines as an inhibitor of collagenase uh, in the eye. So that's a use that's non-antibiotic. There's also a interfloxacin responsive uh, colitis, primarily of boxers. Uh, <coughs> we didn't know how this worked for the longest time. Now we think it has some ability to eradicate invasive intramucosal E. coli. So these E. coli are actually within the mucosa, typically of the colon, and somehow, we don't know why other antibiotics don't do it, but the fluoroquinolones uh, seem to be able to suppress that. So that's kind of nice because we didn't really have much of a treatment before this for this problem. Uh, the macrolides, here's a mechanism. You don't have to know the mechanism. I do want you to know this one up here about collagenase. <clears throat> but uh, you don't have to know the NF, um, whatever kappa B activation is. But this is a uh, protein transcribing genes for inflammation. The bottom line is the macrolides do have anti-inflammatory effects. And this is probably why Tylosin uh, has a use in refractory large bowel diarrhea. Uh, we use um, Metronidazole and Tylosin are two antibiotics we use for colitis, presumably by non-antibiotic uh, means. All right, so that's one you'll know. Now in Canada, they have a Tylosin uh, tablet for dogs. You'll have to get it compounded in the U.S. So they'll, they'll take the feed additive and put it into capsules for you to use that way. Azithromycin. Uh, uh, oral papillomatosis, a viral disease, will respond to this, uh, but that's relatively uncommon. You don't see a lot of that. You need to know that it exists. But the ones with the asterisks in red are the ones I want you to know, all right, the ones that I uh, consider uh, free game for an exam question, okay? <clears throat> and by the way, um, I didn't go into it, but uh, two or three macrolides have shown that they suppress the inflammatory response in some mnemonic conditions. So they looked at pastorella pneumonia and they not only see a benefit from the antibiotic killing the bacteria, but the inflammatory lesions are lessened sometimes in these as well. Okay. And lastly, metronidazole. You use a lot of this. 
stress diarrhea, stress colitis, the dog comes in and is boarded and he develops a diarrhea, people will put him on met metronidazole. We don't know why it works. Here are two possible mechanisms uh, involving changing the intestinal microbiota and therefore influencing things, but it seems to work. All right, so you'll see uh, metronidazole, probably the main one we use in uh, large bowel diarrheas, Tylosin being another one that we sometimes use. All right, I think that's the last slide, isn't it? All right, any questions? All right, I'm gonna just stop there and get an early lunch. All right, any questions? Otherwise, I will see you in MDL at 7.30 on Tuesday. <laughs>